Hello. Welcome to my video sample for my presentation on the topic of office politics. This is a fun sort of, I can't decide if it's a subset of organizational behavior or a, or a separate topic, but it's something interesting. Um, it's important. Uh, you're probably going to face a lot of this in, in, in your career. And uh, so I think it's important to include in any sort of comprehensive discussion uh, about business, which is what I'm trying to do. Um, I always like to preface a conversation on office politics with a couple things. First of all, it's easy to listen to an entire presentation about people doing the wrong thing, following perverse incentives, breakdowns of systems, and uh, walk away cynical. It's important to remember that we're talking about uh, just the, neg uh, just the, just the uh, difficult things. There are plenty of times in life when people do the right thing, even if it's not in their self-interest, they do the right thing for the business, the organization. Sometimes people, uh, you know, you might think that they have an agenda, that's why they're advocating that, but as my father would say, sometimes you give people too much credit for planning. Maybe they just genuinely believe it. Uh, so, um, uh, sometimes bad guys get theirs in the end, um, and uh, so it's important to bear those things in mind that as we talk about this, um, don't, don't let this become uh, a, a, a holistic impression of how things work in the business world. So with that in mind, let's get started. Um, I'd like to start off, first of all, with defining office politics. I think we all sort of have an intuitive feel about it, but it's not always uh, explicitly defined. One definition that I've heard is when people say uh, office politics is any time something, a decision, an action is taken or made based on uh, something other than merit or contribution. You know, someone's promoted and they weren't the best person for the job. Um, that's one way of looking at it. Um, I prefer to be a, to be a little bit more uh, uh, to throw one more thing in there and make it a little bit more sophisticated or complicated if you wish to be critical. But I think uh, it's important. I define office politics as something that is non-systematic. It's outside the systems that are sort of set in place. Now some companies have more systems than others, but if you look at the way I model it, I say that really, if you want to think about office politics, if you want to uh, examine them, you should bear three factors in mind. There's the merit. Uh, are we doing the right thing or not? Is this the right decision or not? The right action? The system has, uh, has our normal decision-making process led us to the right thing. And uh, interests, and, and I'll start off with sort of our self-interests, like do, are we rewarded or do we have perverse incentives to not do the right thing? So with that in mind, I'm going to use mostly the non-systematic definition. Um, notice that if you believe that anything political is anything not based on merit, that sort of means politics is explicitly negative. And oftentimes when we say office politics, it has a negative connotation. But if you say it's not systematic, it's a little bit more ambiguous. Uh, like I said, a little more sophisticated, makes it more complicated. And we're, we're going to talk a little bit about some of those exceptions. So. Um, like I said, uh, that's the model. We're going to start off with self-interest. Now, the good news is oftentimes all of these things are aligned. There's the right decision, the right action, the, the system that we have in place uh, lends itself to that, and the, uh, our interests are properly aligned to do the right thing. So we're not going to spend much time about talking about those because politics doesn't necessarily enter into it, although we'll get to one exception in a moment. Um, the, the difficulty gets in when there's a misalignment between these three things. And the first one I want to talk about is when the system is misaligned. So let's say there's something that we believe is the right decision, maybe we're even incented to do it, but the system that we use to make decisions uh, fails to, to make the right decision or uh, suggest the right course of action. I'll give you an example. Um, sometimes if you're uh, a marketing department you, you have to ha and you want to develop a product, you have to size the market. And if you have a market that doesn't exist yet, if this is a new product, a breakthrough product, there's a little bit of the innovator's dilemma, there is, uh, you, your system might not capture the, the potential. So you think it's the wrong thing to do, pardon me, you think it's the right thing to pursue, but your system won't allocate the resources to it. And this uh, leaves you with a little bit of a quandary. Now probably the easiest thing to do, the, sort of the first thing you would want to do, is fix the system. Try and incorporate uh, the, the factors that, that aren't being captured into the si decision-making process. Um, but there are some potential problems with that. First of all, you might not have the power to unilaterally change the system. And secondly, uh, you know, it might not be practical. In the example I just gave about um, sizing a market, you know, you don't know, you, there's no way to quantify a market that doesn't exist. Um, that leads to, uh, so that brings into question, um, should you exercise sort of extra systematic 
office politics? Should you uh, uh, call in favors and try and posture to, to make, a, make it do the right thing, sort of become an advocate for it internally outside of the system? And that's, that's a debatable point. Um, I remember one time I was working on a consulting project and I had uh, some, some data that supported um, one of my assertions and I showed this to my manager and he goes, look, I, this just can't be right. I don't believe this. I go, but look, it's everything sort of uh, supports it, all the, all the defensible action. He just said, Keith, it's more important that we are correct than that we are defensible. And I, uh, I really had a lot of respect for him for pointing that out. He was right. We had a system that was failing and he said, we're not going to do it anyway. We're going to do the right thing. Um, it's important to note that um, in this context, uh, you know, this, this wouldn't, uh, let me say this, oftentimes our culture sort of glamorizes this. If you watch entertainment and movies, we always like the, uh, the guy who, who uh, you know, the system gets in his way and so he does something extra systematic to get around it, calls, a, calls in a favor, has a friend uh, do something, you know, delay the, delay the approval until he can get something or she can get something in, in place. So it's important to note that if, uh, if you accept my definition of political, every time you see one of those movies and you like somebody doing something because uh, it wor it's a workaround for the system, uh, you're essentially endorsing politics. So be a little careful about uh, how, how easily you denote, uh, connote office politics with something negative. Um, also, uh, let, well, let's move on. I'm going to talk about, uh, so it, uh, that's where the system doesn't give you the right answer. Another question is what if your interests aren't aligned with doing the right thing? What if you have a perverse incentive? Maybe the thing, we know what the right thing is to do, the system gives you the right answer, and, but it doesn't work in your favor. Do you then do sort of the political end run to try and undermine it? And that is, uh, that is obviously a political gambit. Maybe call some friends, pull some strings, posture a little bit. Um, but that is a little bit less ambiguous. That's probably more of a selfish negative thing. Although some people will get into this would say, hey, look, it's, you know, it's a competitive market and politics is all uh, fair game. We'll get to that momentarily. Um, and then the, uh, what do you do if you have a combination of this? Maybe you know the right thing to do, but it's not in your interest and it's uh, outside of what the system would give you. you uh, really the answers are the same like as here like you would want to fix the system also I forgot to mention when your interests are misaligned you would also the first thing you'd like to do is change your incentives so that they're no longer perverse but again that's sometimes out of your uh, power but the uh, the system and the interests are, are misaligned with the right thing well in theory you should do the same thing try and fix the system try and try and fix your incentives but it's important to note now you have two things to fix instead of one plus you have a, an easier time rationalizing doing the self-interested thing because the system gave you that answer even if you don't think it's the right thing to do so even though so this is sort of a more exaggerated form of these two by combining them you're, you're, uh, the, 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 the bar is raised to uh, uh, stay, stay the course and do the right thing also, so far we've talked about interests being self-interest. Sometimes there are other parties that have different interests than yours. So let's say all of these things are well aligned. We, you know, we know the right thing to do, the system gives us the right answer, and it's in our best interest, but there's someone else in the organization or uh, maybe outside the organization who, who is uh, in, confl in conflict with this. And so they try and act political. They start calling in favors. They start playing dirty. The question is, should you play dirty as well? And that becomes a big question of, uh, you know, do two wrongs make a right? Or are we fighting fire with fire? You've got different cliches to address that. It's kind of a debatable point. And then the last one is you can also have other combinations. But uh, these are the main ones. I think they'd just be more elaborate than is necessary to discuss in this sample. And uh, so anyway, th that's sort of the model that I use. Uh, it's a little bit uh, novel because I add in the systematic element, but let's talk about some of the complications. The first one is ambiguity. If you'll, uh, if you'll notice, oh, let me take one more point on this. Um, oftentimes office politics has a negative connotation, but it's not always clear here. So for example, if you're doing the wrong thing because it's your have perverse incentives, that might be a little bit more clearly wrong. But if you're, uh, if you're, doing, uh, if you're pulling pol playing politics because you, you think the, the system isn't rewarding the right thing, that's a little bit less clear. Or if you're uh, challenging the, the uh, if you're sort of pulling strings and, and, and fighting dirty because you think somebody else is doing the same and you want to balance that out and do the right thing, that's not quite as clear. So under the merit, you know, uh, uh, pardon me, if you define it, anything political as non-merit, it all, it's all bad, but if it's uh, non-systematic, it can be a little more ambiguous. Speaking of ambiguity, it's a different context for ambiguity. Um, I've treated all of this as if it's binary, like 
Uh, it's either the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do. The system gives you one answer or the other. It's your interest or not. The truth is sometimes these things can be ambiguous. It's not quite clear what the right thing to do is, but we know that that's what the system tells us. So what do we do in those situations? So that's a complication. That can make it more difficult and, and sort of change the thresholds. You know, how far out of a line, how, how confident are we that it's the wrong thing to do before we challenge the system on it? Um, another thing, another problem you have is um, when you take non-systematic behavior, you do undermine the system. Now, a lot of people, you know, sort of, uh, fun to talk about, especially we Americans, we like to fight the system. We think system is sort of a negative connotation, but there are reasons for it. Because if you don't have a system, um, everything becomes hyper-politicized and you can't necessarily trust people to do the right thing. So the, the purpose of a system is to, um, is to add some impartiality to decision making. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. And even if you're fighting fire with fire down here because you wanna, you wanna do the right thing ultimately, that can be a sort of a short term versus a long term thinking. Because in the short term, that might get you the right thing. But in the long term, you've set the precedent that we're not gonna make decisions using our system and that undermines it. Um, the next thing I wanna talk about under complications is the issue of relationships. I once read a, a provocative article to me uh, with somebody saying, look, office politics, sort of defending office politics, it's not bad because we need to have personal relationships with the people we work with. And politics is really about uh, ha using those personal relationships to get work done. Well, I, li I think that's a little bit of a broad stroke. I would actually deconstruct it a little more finely and say there's some good and some bad. So for example, if you're building trust, in terms of working with other people. I think that's a good thing. I'm not really sure I'd call it politics though. Likewise, if you're learning who is good at something and who isn't, or you know, you work with someone regularly and so you know that, look, they're really good at this, but this they're gonna need a little help with, so I'll do it for them before I send it to them. Knowledge of how to get things done is, is uh, advantageous, but again, I wouldn't call it pol political necessarily, although this author did. I think that I, I, I define uh, office politics a little differently. Um, the last one, this is where I think it gets a little darker, is what if you have a relationship and you have sort of a lot, you scratch my back, I scratch yours. That's the old expression, I put that down as back scratching. Well, that is a little bit more uh, uh, about promoting your own interests. So that's not so clear. So relationships are a little bit more complicated, but you know, it's interesting that sometimes uh, we end up with, uh, in, in relationships, people will expect us to take their side because they're our friend or maybe our family or we have a relationship with them, even if it's not the right thing to do. And that's a really complicated situation because that's essentially politics at the expense of merit. So, you know, what do you do if you have a family member who's been caught embezzling? Do you, do you, uh, uh, <laughs> do you cooperate with the prosecution or not? I mean, you're, you're sort of torn there. And oftentimes, you know, if you have a friend at work and they do something, they make a mistake and the boss asks you about it and you say, well, yeah, we messed that one up. Um, they might be mad at you. They're like, why didn't you cover for me? You're my friend. Well, that's at the expense of merit. So this can put these things into conflict. Um, last thing I just want to talk about is uh, what if you have an advocacy system? What if uh, you have a system where there's really no, no clarity between um, what is right and what is uh, systematic. The, the idea is you advocate most fully for your position and someone in competition with you will advocate for theirs and then a wise adjudicator will decide between the two. And that sort of throws off some of this because it, it makes, uh, uh, you know, sometimes the judicial system can work a little bit like this. You know, a, a defense attorney is not expected to be well-rounded. They are supposed to be an advocate for the defense. Uh, and, and so that, that sort of, the, crafting narratives, manipulating perceptions becomes a little bit more acceptable in a situation like that. So let's move on then. So that's a little bit, I've given you some sort of background, I think my mental models for this. Now let's talk a little bit about some of the philosophies that you can adopt. Uh, and I wanted to, you know, some people might start off with this. I wanted to give a little bit of a foundation before we got into it. But I, we have the, what I call the pure of heart or the rise above politics. This is sort of the philosophy that anything uh, political is inherently bad. Now, the good news about that is it's well-meaning. I think it's trying to get to merit. Uh, but there are a couple of concerns to be raised. One is, um, what if we have one of these situations where uh, the system is failing, we're not getting the right decision out? What do you do then? That's a conflict that the pure heart rise above philosophy doesn't prepare you for necessarily. Also, under that philosophy, um, there's one question is, is it naive? Like, look, if you don't practice politics, 
that's one thing if you want to rise above it, but does that put you at a disadvantage to the more aggressive people who practice them? And that leads us to what I think the second more, slight, you know, sort of increasing aggressiveness. The more aggressive position is, look, even we, we might regret a lot of politics, but they exist, and so it's important to train people in the art of politics, just not necessarily as because we think politics are the right thing, but as sort of a self-defense. We want to prepare them, and so uh, uh, polit political training is like self-defense. Then the last view is the most aggressive at all. It's like, hey, look, it's all fa all's fair, kind of like an advocacy system. You know, this is how things get done, and therefore the better at it. And if you can use this, if you can use politics to advantage yourself, then that's fine. And you know, sort of a, almost a uh, an extrapolation of market capitalism. If if uh, competition always brings out the best, then then you know every game I can think of will lead to the best conclusion for society or the business. Um, I, I'm a little skeptical of that. There's also an in between these two that I want to talk about, which is uh, sort of using politics proactively but under limited circumstances. Some of the circumstances that I thought it was merited for. Um, so with that, those philosophies in mind, let's move on to some of the common tra traps you can fall into. Um, one of them is that interests, your self-interest can skew your perspective. And this is what I talked about earlier. If you take a, a, a misalignment between merit and systematic and you throw in a little ambiguity, sometimes we, we think whatever serves our self-interest is uh, the, uh, we're in, uh, prone to interpret whatever our self-interest is as the right thing to do. We kind of, uh, uh, the information we filter, the information that supports our position, we take at face value, uh, but we're skeptical of the, you know, we highly scrutinize information that works against us. So that can, um, that can skew our perspective. We're not being honest with ourselves about what the right thing to do is. This is, um, uh, Warren Buffett says, self-interest skews introspection. And I've sort of taken a twist on that phrase. Opened it up a little bit. Another trap is, um, oftentimes we decide you know, which philosophy to adopt. We might adopt the all's fair philosophy under the guise of the competition will bring out the best. But the real reason is maybe we're skilled at it or we like it and we're a personality that's frustrated by systems so we support politics just because we're prone towards it and you can flip that around so if you have people who are really comfortable with systems but are a little bit more challenged on developing relationships they might all they might hate poli they might oppose politics even if there's some value to them because they don't care for them and they sort of these are sort of the bitter people like man it's all political and sometimes that's because they haven't figured out how to uh, uh, interact in an environment like that Another thing we already sort of talked about is, you know, if someone else is being, um, uh, has interests that conflict with the right thing to do, do you, uh, do you, and they start using political behavior, do you follow suit? Does that, are you fighting fire with fire? That sounds like a good thing, but, or is it two wrongs make a right? That's uh, a more skeptical view. Um, another issue I want to point out is what I call the invasive species. This is where somebody who is you know, you might have a really cooperative group that follows a system really carefully, but then you put a person in that group who's much more aggressive politically, and what happens is if they, they might get short-term gain because people are just cooperating with them and they're just taking, and that can promote themselves in the group, and then uh, the boss sees that and says, hey, this person's really getting results, promotes that person, and that just tells the entire group that this is the kind of aggressive behavior that gets rewarded, and all of a sudden, you lose your corporate culture. Um, the last one I want to talk about is people who say, you know, look, I'm only going to play the game until I get to the top, and then I'm going to fix it. And there are uh, several problems with that. Um, one of them is, you know, it's hard to switch gears for something you've been doing your whole career now that you're in charge. You start to some point, you, uh, you become uh, accustomed to that viewpoint. But I think the other issue is, look, only one person gets to be at the top. So even if you have a person who gets to the top and says, okay, now I'm going to be non-political, we're all going to do things on merit, everybody else throughout the entire organization is selling out and playing politics until they get to the top. So the organization is corrupt, and the one person at the top can't necessarily change all of that. So those are some of the traps you can fall into. Now, I've spent a lot of time talking about sort of the theory, and I know it's a little bit dry, but I think it's important because... Uh, I, I think the importance of it is we, we oftentimes don't get the, the theory. We don't think about it theoretically. We jump right to, uh, you know, war stories. Um, so I, put, I skewed the sample a little bit towards the theory, but in live presentations I talk a little bit more about the actions and the examples, and uh, it's, it's a little bit more fun. They're going to get a little short shrift here today, but I will throw out a few. 
So if this is, you know, we've been talking about politics at the high level, what, what do these actions actually um, turn into? And one of them is uh, political action is when you take credit, whether something is your idea or not, or you uh, avoid blame for, try and avoid blame for something, whether it's your fault or not. Um, another political action is, you know, when you're promoting allies uh, and or sabotaging rivals. So you sort of, this sort of becomes a team function. Everybody, you know, you and I, we're all friends, so we're going to work together and rise together, and uh, rivals we will beat. And you might say, well, sabotaging rivals sounds really negative, but uh, you might be, but that's just because it's general right now. I bet there's a person in your career who, if I mention them you, and you had a chance to really shark them good, you might do so because you thought they deserved it. There's really somebody that you think was out of line. And so, uh, you know, the, the don't, don't, be, don't think you're necessarily above that. If you found somebody that you consider to be a sufficiently unsympathetic victim, you might be willing to go along with sabotage as well. Uh, another, another political action is when you try and uh, lobby for resources that are good or you try and rid yourself of the liabilities. Uh, some people or projects you try and avoid projects that never seem to go anywhere. And then the last one I talk about is you know it's controlling the perceptions. You try and manipulate perceptions, you want to change the narrative. Now that can be as disingenuous as something like lying but there's a spectrum. There's also you know at the opposite of lying there's telling a whole uh, two-sided story, you know, telling both sides of the story. And in between there, there's like, well, what if you're only telling select information? You're giving one side of the story, you're accentuating the positive. Uh, that's uh, uh, not necessarily lying, but it isn't as uh, open as telling both sides of the story. Likewise, there's the, what, I, what uh, I've heard referred to as the Clinton lie, which is literally accurate, but intended to mislead. This was like Bill Clinton in the Monica Lewinsky trial saying, I was never alone with that woman. And then it turns out he was, and he said, oh, in the building, I thought you meant the room. So, you know, according to his sort of narrow set, you know, he was, he was crafting a narrative, even though that wasn't really reflective of the reality. So uh, here's the war stories. I'll just tell a few of these. Um, one of them is, uh, uh, you know, people tend to sort of to avoid blame. People will leave at the high point of an organization and then move on, maybe have to leave the company and get a new job. And then when it, because they see it potentially going to crash. And then once it crashes, even if it was there, fault, they'll say, I don't know what their problem was. It was fine while I was there. It's amazing how quickly it went downhill after I left. And for that reason, sometimes you want to judge people's performance uh, more by after they leave than while they're actually there, especially if they're in a, a relatively senior position. Um, the, oh, I also wanted to, I skipped a point. Back here on the actions, um, I, I listed most of these as sort of selfish. Uh, sort of self-serving, but it's important to remember sometimes these are, you know, you're not just, just gaining resources to improve your own power. You can do it because you want to put resources behind the right thing to do. Sorry, I forgot that. Anyway, back to my examples. Also, uh, res reserved enthusiasm. This is where I, uh, uh, criticizing through reserved enthusiasm. Uh, this was an example where I had a college professor who was talking about the other courses that his department offered. And he would go down the list and tell you which ones to take. He would say, class A, that's a spectacular class, that professor's great. Class B, that's a good class. Class C, that's a good class. Class D is exceptional. Now the reality is, class B and C, he didn't really think he were very good, but he can't politically get away with saying that. So he contrasted the enthusiasm there. And there's a couple of sort of uh, interaction tricks that I can use, that I can teach to uh, illustrate that. Um, another example in terms of uh, ridding yourself of liabilities is you give really good reviews to your worst worker hoping that they'll get promoted in, out of your department. Um, th and then the last one I want to give you here is uh, uh, success despite your actions rather than because of. Sometimes I've, uh, I remember one time I was working at uh, General Motors, we brought on a model that I thought had a really ugly grill, but it sold really well because it was a good car. And I'm sure the stylist of the grill went around telling everybody, you know, wow, everybody loves my styling. But the reality was they were trying to craft a narrative and control perception. The real, I, I, I maintain, uh, speaking of ambiguity, this is my opinion, but I maintain that that car succeeded despite that awful styling rather than because of it. So in conclusion to office politics, um, you know, I can teach this depending on the philosophy that your organization uh, adopts. So if it's a, sort of a pure heart, Pure of heart, rise above politics. Uh, maybe this actually isn't, uh, you know, I could teach it, uh, some of the theory, and just emphasize why it's the negatives to it. 
but uh, you might be better off with just sort of a regular motivational speaker because they tend to be much more one-sided about this than I am. I, I like delving into the ambiguity. Um, but we can also teach it as sort of a self-defense class, sort of like, look, these aren't really behaviors that we as an organization advocate, but sometimes you're gonna deal with them in your career, so it's important to be aware of them so you're able to defend against them. And then the last one is, you know, we can teach these as sort of proactive, like these are things to use if you think it'll do the right thing for the business. And that's sort of a, uh, an in-between between self-defense and just uh, game on, all's fair. So I hope you found this interesting. Uh, if you'd like to see something like this presented at your organization or event, please contact me for a proposal at keithwhite.com. I look forward to doing business with you. Thank you.